Before we get started with the reading, I wanted to share this photo with you. Take a close look at the woman in the middle of the photograph, and then look at the tattoo she has right there. That woman, believe it or not, walked into our tasting room one afternoon, and as the saying goes, she changed my life forever. So I wanted to share that with you. Let's get started. This is chapter six. The title is called Shock and Awe. Why decorate your skin with permanent ink? To signify membership in a tribe, from sorority sisters to gangs and the Yakuza of Japan. To express sorrow, love, creativity, or a point of view as a constant reminder of who you are or who you aspire to be. Make a statement, wearable art, be cool, commemorate a milestone or rite of passage. This wasn't Carrie Ann's first tattoo. When she and Jenny Lee were in college, they road trip to Austin and after a night of music and drinking on 6th Street, Jenny Lee escorted Carrie Ann to a tattoo parlor to join the Sisterhood of Ink. For Carrie Ann, the cougar symbolized a new life chapter. She had been a successful huntress in business, and the tattoo signaled her liberation from the corporate world and unleashing of her animalistic spirit. Piercing her skin with ink needles was a catharsis, a clear transition to her wine adventure, moving from a glass tower to the soil of her vineyard, accompanied by pain as in childbirth, one of life's events she wouldn't experience, each sting of the artist's needle taking away an insult, a barb, a catcall, an unwanted pass on the job, each prick building her symbol of strength, determination, and liberation. No going back. And what a statement it was, this cougar, for all to see. For this is who she would become, the cougar winemaker, and consumers of wine would be her prey. She discussed it with Jenny Lee and Steph that night under the moon wine, and they held her hand as the artist prodded, poked, pierced, decorated her skin, the epidermis where it's thinnest, covering her sternum. Ouch! And no shit! She grit her teeth, and then at Steph's soft coaxing, she took the deepest of breaths, exhaled slowly, closed her eyes, and her mind soared out the parlor to rows of a vineyard, she thinning overgrown shoots, tucking, pulling, working the vines, working the dirt with her hands. And when she emerged from the trance-like state, a feline butterfly emerged from the cocoon, a cougar cub expelled from the womb, leaving anger, resentment, and thoughts of a lawsuit behind. Poof! Gone. Released. As inevitable as Sheila and Paul's winery would be named after their dog, Carrie Ann's was Cougar Winery, and she was the star. And when you consider the three best friends were proud graduates of the University of Houston, whose mascot is Shasta the Cougar, the idea of Carrie Ann tattooing Shasta's likeness on her skin is not as preposterous as you think. She was a marketing pro who had successfully launched and managed several products. When Carrie Ann put her mind to a project, she did it Texas big. Her tattoo was the ultimate vanity license plate, an unforgettable business card, the perfect advertisement for her new venture. She would launch her sales by marketing her Cougar brand to more than 200,000 alumni and alumni of the UH and to women of the world of a certain age with lust for life. Paul was shocked and awed by this sight, shouting, Bravo! Give it up for the Cougar! And the neighbors cheered for the woman christened Cougar Carrie Ann. Paul thought she was stunning and that tattoo suited her. And didn't that tattoo share the same emerald eyes as her mistress? Afterwards, Paul admitted to friends it was the first time he, a 40-something, looked at a woman over 50 as sexy. Carrie Ann's hot, and her friend from Texas is good-looking too. I hope I look that good when I'm their age. Did it hurt? Paul asked. Nothing I couldn't handle. Why did you get it? It's something I had to do. You look amazing. Oh. Paul noticed a man sitting on a barrel, 
dipping a wine thief through the hole and filling his glass. Who's that on your barrel? That's Joe the wino. You should keep an eye on him. He might contaminate your wine. Oh, don't worry, she said. Anyone who brings me a bottle of Chateau Lafitte Rocho can sit on my barrel any time he wants. Hell, he can sit on my lap and drink wine from my lips. You never invited me to do that. You never asked, she replied, batting her eyes. Are you drunk? I'm enjoying myself. Where's Sheila? Cleaning the house. She'll be over soon. Miguel mingled with guests, carrying a beer bottle, with a gruff voice, bravado, and a black patch over one eye. He could be brutal with his crew when he needed to enforce discipline and get things done. Yet, there was also a generous side he showed recent rivals, for if he helped them find work, they could rent a place from him. He was practically the patron, el jefe, of a company town. He also made a few extra bucks selling wine that fell off the truck and wood that fell off the trees. Two of Miguel's crew, Rodrigo and Pedro, banner back and forth as they pull wire to support the irrigation lines, then wrap plastic cool wraps around the wire and hose to hold the drip line above ground. Pedro called out in Spanish, Ranchero Chida! The rancherette is happy. Hola, Don Miguel! Rodrigo called. Why don't you give us a hand? I'm working over here, with a beer, keeping my eye on you. Which eye? asked Rodrigo. The eye can, cannot see sees everything. I'd rather have your hand helping us than your eye. Mucho trabajo, mucho dinero, said the boss. More work, more money. Did you spend a lot of money in Tijuana last night? I visited my little senorita. She must be pretty for such a rich man. Beautiful and expensive. As beautiful as the ranchera? There are many beauties in Tijuana, but no puma as fine as the ranchera. Patron, be careful. A cougar will kill a coyote, they laughed. Carrie Ann called out, Hey, Miguel, would you mind telling the guys to stop attaching curl wraps to the drip line? Why? They are making the line straight and beautiful. Paul asked Carrie Ann, Won't the water line sag if they don't wrap it to the wire? I like them droopy. I bet you won't say that in five years, he said with a glance towards her buxom bosom guarded by a wildcat. To Paul, Saggy drip lines illustrated a woman's softer features. Sheila told him she wanted the drip lines in her vineyard straight as a beam of the light. She has to have this. She has to have that, Steph said to Jenna Lee, mimicking Carrie Ann, telling Miguel what to do. We should just call her Shasta, and they screamed at the inside joke. Have a sip or pinky dip of this, Carrie Ann said, told Paul, handing him a clear plastic cup of wine she filled from a dark, unlabeled bottle. What is it? It's a blend of Merlot, Brunello, and Cab Franc. Nice color. Where did you get the grapes? I got the Merlot from Mac, of course, the Brunello from Joe, and the Cab Franc from Belle Marie. Paul sipped. This is good, he said, although he had no sense of smell. At least he had polite manners most of the time. It's one of my favorites. Louie, try this. Paul dipped a finger into his cup, held it in front of the nose of the dog who sniffed, licked once, and shook his head. Hmm, only one lick, Paul said to himself. The dog has good taste, but no manners. It must taste lousy. He likes it, Paul lied. Tell me more about Joe. How did he get that nickname? You haven't heard of him? He was all over the news. He wanted to double the size of his winery, but ran into all kinds of government regulations. He decided to cancel the expansion, which meant fewer jobs, and he blamed the government for stifling employment. Fox News got wind of the story, dubbed him Joe the Wino, and the name stuck. You should meet him. He owns a number of high-tech businesses and one of the largest Republican donors in this area. What business is he in? His investments are in Telegon. He was an early investor in Qualcomm and made tens of millions. He owns a large enterprise software company. Is business good? Haven't you seen his house? It's the magnificent villa that sits on the hill over there, surrounded by that huge vineyard. Speaking of vineyards, said Paul, did Miguel do all this? A team of his people. He supervised. Would you recommend him? He does good work, but you need to keep an eye on him. 
Why is that? He charges by the hour, and projects drag on longer than it takes an armadillo to crawl from El Paso to Brownsville. How did he lose his eye in a fight? Where does he get his crew? He's godfather around here. Migrants alive and working for work, and Miguel finds some jobs, even lends some money to get started and rents them places to stay. Is he legal? He was born in Mexico, but is a U.S. citizen. What about his guys? I doubt it. How much does he charge? His rate is $140 a day. He's the manager and costs more. He charges $100 a day for each guy. That seems like a lot for a day laborer. Does Miguel take a cut of their pay? I think so. I pay Miguel and he pays them. Bluey, she called. Come here, boy. The Aussie jumped up to her, whining in a high-pitched voice. Good boy, how are you? She said in falsetto, as if talking to a baby, as he barked with a joy, then sniffed her crotch. You never let me do that, Paul said. You dog, she teed. Bitch, he shot back with a smile. When I die, I want to I want to come back as that dog. Hey, you can't call me the B word anymore. I'm now a cute cougar cub, so call me Pussycat. And the social butterfly flapped her wings, taking flight, delighting each guest with her presence as she fluttered from milkweed to milkweed. A woman wearing a dress made her entrance. This is a work party. Why are you dressed in white? Paul said. Sheila, welcome to Cougar Winery, said Carrie Ann. I'm so glad you could join us. Paul told me you're you're fixing to plant a vineyard. That's so exciting. When do y'all think you plant the vines? We start clearing the land as soon as we can, can and plant in winter. What varietals? I really want to plant champagne grapes and Pinot Noir. Good luck with that, said Carrie Ann, explaining those grapes don't do well in this microclimate, punching a hole in the balloon of Sheila's dream. Paul excused himself to meet Joe, extending his hand to shake as Joe lifted a bottle to pour. Have a glass of this, Joe offered. Paul received the libation in his plastic cup. He went through the pantomime of smelling and sipped, detecting a sensation unknown to his palate. Although he couldn't smell, he could discern texture, and this wine was unusually smooth in his mouth and throat. That's good. What is it? Grand Cru Burg Burgundy from Nuit Saint Georges. What do you think? I like it. Where did you get it? I brought back several cases from our visit to Burgundy last month. How were you able to get several cases on a plane? Paul asked. It's my plane. I flew it. Nice, was all Paul could say. When he returned home, he googled the wine and discovered he had sipped his first thousand dollar bottle, conceding he hadn't made anything as sophisticated. I heard from Carrie Ann you're in the mobile telecom business. How's your business in China? Paul asked. Not as good as I expected. Maybe I can help, offered Paul, who briefly told Joe about his experience and qualifications. They agreed to meet the following week, shook hands, and Paul left to speak with Miguel. Jenny Lee, whose tongue loosened with wine, asked Carrie Ann, Sugar, why haven't you introduced me to your friend Paul? Because he's married? He seems quite enamored with you. Who isn't? Did he ever make a pass? No, but maybe he doesn't shit in his own backyard. Well, sweetheart, he can come and do his business in my yard any time. She walked up to Paul to introduce herself. So you're Jenny Lee. I've heard so much about you. School teachers are such kind people. I'm not in the classroom anymore, but thank you. I run the instructional technology department. What's new in Texas schools? Well, we're working on a project to make food trucks. What the truck? Yes, sir. We're taking school buses, ripping out the seats, installing more appliances than you'd see in a chef's kitchen. It's quite a project involving almost everyone in the district, from career tech students installing ovens and welding gas pipes, to my department, which is installing a mobile wireless transmitter and electronic payment system to swipe credit cards. The culinary students The culinary students prepare and cook food for Friday night football games, and during the week, the trucks serve up really good lunches and snacks at school. They sell out every day. That sounds like a great project. 
I heard from Carrie Ann you're thinking about planting Tempranillo grapes. You know Tempranillo? Sure do. There's more Tempranillo in Texas than Spain. You don't say. Tell me more. I'd love to taste Texas Tempranillo. After talking 20 minutes with Jenny Lee, Paul thought if he ever needed to start life over, he'd move to Texas. She and Carrie Ann made that big an impression on him. And what she said about Texas wine picked his interest. After work, Rodrigo drove his navy blue Ford F-150 down the mountain and into the center of Escondido, a city of 150,000 residents, 30 miles north of downtown San Diego. He passed the California Center for the Arts and kept driving south down Escondido Boulevard, past Lourdes Restaurant with the famous tortilla soup, turned right into an apartment complex, slowing down for kids on bicycles who crisscrossed the parking lot. Hola, muchachos! Hola, señor Rigo! They shouted back. The kids kicked a soccer ball at him, and he deftly dribbled it with his feet and passed it back, happy to play with them a few minutes and give them pointers. The blacktop of the apartment complex was a soccer field and bicycle track by day and occasional drug market at night. When Rodrigo was lucky to find work in a vineyard, he found solitude among the vines. His other source of enjoyment, when he couldn't find work Sundays, was playing soccer in San Marcos Walnut Grove Park. My dear husband, said Rosa, his wife, welcome home. He ducked his head and walked into the two-room apartment they shared with another family. What do you have for me today? Rodrigo handed her four bills to his esposa. Tiente, curante, sesante, ochenta, she counted. Have you been out drinking? Why do you bring me so little? I'm paid eighty dollars for a day's work. It's all there. You're worth twice as much. Miguel, that culo, you need to find another job. He helped us with so much. Yes, he did, and I'm grateful. Grateful he rents us this tiny apartment in this drug-infested neighborhood. Grateful he pays you less than you're worth. Yes, I'm grateful, but it's time for you to find a new job and for us to move into a bigger home. We came here for a better life, not worse.